Hello and welcome to the National Solar Observatory or NSO. We're really glad you could join us today and we hope that you find our Eclipse web series helpful in the run-up to the major event next August 21st. Here at NSO the Sun is our number one priority and what better excuse to share what we know about our celestial object than the major solar eclipse coming up next year. This is going to be a particularly special event since it's the first time that an eclipse has swept across the US in almost a century. An eclipse of some kind is going to be visible from every state and for a lucky few they're going to get the chance to witness a total solar eclipse. So from Oregon down to South Carolina will be the place to be on August 21st, 2017. The difference between the total solar eclipse and a partial eclipse, which will be visible from the rest of the country, is that on the path of totality, the moon will completely block the entire disk of the sun. For the rest of the country, those who will experience a partial eclipse, the moon will move in front of the sun, but won't completely block it. So this webinar series, is geared towards helping people prepare for the solar eclipse coming up. We're going to provide information that will hopefully be helpful on Eclipse Day, but also in the run-up to the eclipse, and give you ideas on ways to engage and educate your local community. If you have anything that you'd like us to cover, or if you have questions, feel free to email outreach at nso.edu, or you can get us on Twitter at NatSolarOBS, and we'll get back to you with answers and ideas as soon as we can. So each month in our webcast, we're going to cover three main topics. We're going to have our solar spotlight segment, where I'll introduce some basic solar concepts that will hopefully help you understand what's going on during the eclipse a little better. We'll have an eclipse tips segment, where we'll demonstrate some fun activities that will help to get kids engaged and interested in what's going on during the solar eclipse. And finally, we'll have a special guest scientist that will join us each week. They're going to share with us some of their cutting edge research that's related to the sun or the solar eclipse. All of this will be archived on the NSO webpage, www.nso.edu, where you'll be able to get it on the NSO YouTube channel as well. So, let's get started. We're going to begin our web series today by introducing the sun, the sun by the numbers. We're also going to give you some context on to why it's important for us to understand the sun and how it can help contribute to our knowledge of other celestial objects and the universe overall. We're going to have a special guest speaker this afternoon, Dr. Adam Kowalski, who is a, an assistant professor here at the National Solar Observatory, and he's going to talk about other stars and how the sun can help us understand what's going on elsewhere in the universe. So let's talk numbers. The sun is the biggest object in our entire solar system, and trying to understand or comprehend just how big it is is, is really quite difficult. Uh, it's more than 800,000 miles across, which is an enormous number. It's one that's really difficult to comprehend. One way to think about it is that the sun is 109 times bigger than the Earth in diameter. So that's not in volume. That's just if you lined the Earth up side by side 109 times, then you would finally get to the diameter of the sun. If you were to fill the sun full of Earths, you would need more than 1 million earth size planets to fill the, the volume of the sun. So hopefully that will help to put things in perspective. We're talking big scales here. By comparison, the earth is four times bigger than the moon. So that means that we need four moons lined up side by side to compare to the size of the earth. When we look at the sky, the moon and the sun look roughly about the same size. But we know that the sun is significantly bigger than the moon. In order for that to be the case, that means that the sun has to be significantly further away than the moon is. In fact, that's a factor of 400. So the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, but the sun is 400 times further away than the moon. And that means that when we see the two of them in the sky, they look about the same size. Lucky for us, it's that fact that means that we get solar eclipses in the first place. Because the two bodies are almost exactly the same size from our perspective, when they are aligned, they completely eclipse each other. The location of the Earth in the solar system is fortuitous in many different ways, not least of which is the fact that we live in a special area called the Goldilocks Zone. The Goldilocks Zone is a, is a region of habitability around a star, and this, this is not just our sun, this is any stars that may have planets around it. And this is where the conditions are just right to be able to support life. So it's not too hot, it's not too cold, it has enough atmosphere to support the air that we need to be able to breathe. It has the right atmospheric pressure to be able to have water. 
And lucky for us, this is, the Earth is right in the middle of the Goldilocks zone. As you can see here, Venus is inside of the Goldilocks zone, and so being able to support life would be very, very difficult, if not impossible. And on the other side of us, Mars is on the outer edge of the Goldilocks zone. It's likely to be on the boundary of being able to support life. So the sun is the reason that we are able to survive on this planet. It allows the, the crops to grow so we have food to eat. The light that comes from the sun enters our eyes and allows us to see. We're completely dependent on the sun, and yet we take it for granted a lot of the time. Hopefully through this eclipse series, you'll start to realize just how important the sun is and how much value it brings to our everyday life. Okay, so it's time for our eclipse tips segment. Today we're going to build a scale model of the Earth, Moon and Sun to really demonstrate those numbers that we talked about earlier on. This is a great NASA funded activity that was developed under Project FIRST by the Multiverse Education Group at the Space Sciences Lab. And all of the uh, materials are available online at the website that you see here. In addition, it's really important to start this activity with some pictures of the sun. So this is, this is a, an arts and craft demo where we're going to recreate the sun um, using paints and, and artistic materials. But we need some inspiration for this first. So if you want to go to the NSO webpage that you can see here, we've put some, uh, some inspirational solar pictures up that you can download and print off and, and share uh, as artistic inspiration for this activity. Okay, well we have a, a video here that will describe what's going on. I'm going to play it for you now and you can see for yourself how to go about this activity. If you decide to do this or if you have ideas for how you might adapt it, please let us know. Uh, list them in the comments. You can also get us on Twitter, like we said earlier. We're always delighted to hear when people actually implement these activities uh, and see how useful they are. In this activity, we're going to build a sun that is four and a half foot wide and compare that size to the size of the Earth and the Moon, respectively. In order to best figure out how to lay out my cardstock, which was too small for an individual sun, I started by laying out a 54 inch square on the ground using painter's tape. Once I had my cardboard measuring more than 54 and a half inches, which will be the eventual size of our sun, I used a homemade compass to draw a circle 54 and a half inches in diameter. I did this using a drawing pin, a piece of string that's half the diameter, 27 and a quarter inches, and a pencil. Now that we have the hard work done, it's time to have some fun. Here I'm using yellow, orange and red paint just to paint the sun in any way I please. This is where those pictures that we showed earlier on can really play a big part in this, depending on the color scheme that you show kids or whether or not they have uh, spicules or granules that you can see near the photosphere or whether you see uh, filaments or sunspots. This is really where the kids have a really, really great time decorating their own sun. Okay, so once we have our main sun finished, uh, it's time to add some detail. So you can add as much or as little detail as you like. At the very minimum, I'd recommend adding some sunspots. Um, we added a bunch of different details here. We have some coronal loops and some filaments and a prominence. We're gonna get into the details of all of them in later webcasts, but this is just to give you an idea of what, what might be possible uh, just using regular household materials. All right, so this is the finicky part. Since we need to make sure that our Earth, Moon, and Sun are all to scale, we have to start somewhere. So we started with half inch stickers for our Earth. In our case, 109 times half an inch is 54 and a half inches, which is the diameter of our Sun. If you're using stickers that are larger or smaller than half an inch, you need to make sure that you scale your Sun accordingly. The same is true for what you use to represent the moon. In our case, we've used four 1 8 inch drawing pins, but you can use whatever is appropriately sized. So this is our finished product. As you can see, it's lots of detail, but also pretty simple at the same time. This is the kind of thing that with the right inspiration and materials, you could have an awful lot of fun with. So we've gone through and demonstrated this activity as it's described in the, the lesson plan. However, there's lots and lots of ways that you can adapt it for your own needs. 
The biggest thing is that because this is a scale model, we need to make sure that the size of our sun and the earth and the moon are all related to each other. We've started with a 54 and a half inch sun, which happens to be 109 times half an inch. So our earth is half an inch. We've used half inch stickers for that. And then we've gotten one eighth inch drawing pins to represent our moon. So we said earlier that four moons make up one earth and 109 earths make up one sun. So that's our scale. We need to keep to that. However, you can adapt this uh, in any way you want. Like we said, you can remove the scale model aspect of it if you want and just have it as an arts and craft activity. Get your students or your children to, to just paint the sun and to use their imaginations to represent the pictures that you have. We've used whatever craft materials we can gather, pipe cleaners and gift ribbon and paint. Um, there's really no limit to what you can do with this uh, and it's a, a, at the end of the day you have a great product that you can hang up on your wall. Once you finish building your sun, you can then have an extension to this activity and actually get the students to figure out how far away you need to be for the moon and the sun to appear the same size. So I'll, I'll give you the answer. It's about 495 feet, so it's, it's quite a ways away. But what you want to do is make it so is it, when you can hold up your drawing pin moon and you look back at where your sun is hanging, that they look about the same size. And you should actually be able to move the drawing pin in front of the sun and eclipse the sun if you can. Okay, for our final segment today, we have Dr. Adam Kowalski, who's going to tell us how you can use the sun as a guide to other stars in the universe. Adam? Hello, my name is Adam Kowalski, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Colorado in the National Solar Observatory. Uh, today, I'm gonna talk to you about the sun and other stars. And in particular, I'm gonna go over um, solar flares and how we also observe them on other stars. Now, of course, the sun is a star, um, but the sun is um, several hundred thousand times closer to us than the other stars. So we understand it much better and we see what's going on um, on the sun um, in much uh, greater detail. So uh, I know some of the things I'm going to talk about today um, are going to be covered in a later series, but I'm going to give you a broad overview um, of the sun and other stars and how, how they all fit together and uh, come back to this idea of uh, the habitable zone, not here but around our nearest star and a very exciting discovery um, with that. So the sun is um, one of a hundred billion stars in our galaxy alone um, and it's the best studied of these stars and probably it will always be the best understood and studied star. Um, we observe the sun at uh, all wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum, um, x-rays, radio waves, of course the optical light that we see, um, ultraviolet light, infrared, and even gamma rays. Uh, the sun's atmosphere covers a remarkable range of temperatures from about 6,000 degrees at the surface, um, which is the uh, range of the atmosphere that produces the light we see. And um, I just want to say by surface, I don't mean a surface how we're used to on Earth, but the sun's surface actually is um, uh, about 100 times less dense than the air around us. But it's so hot that it produces its own glow and radiation. Um, so that's what we see uh, every, you know, when you go outside every day. Um, but as you go higher in the sun's atmosphere, um, the, uh, the gas becomes a million times more dense and it reaches incredible temperatures of millions of degrees. Um, these different temperatures through the layers of the sun's atmosphere, um, they produce different amounts of light at each wavelength. And by measuring the amount of light at each wavelength, we form what's called a spectrum. And from this spectrum, we can uh, measure the temperature at each uh, layer in the atmosphere of the sun. And we can also measure how the temperature changes when interesting things happen in the sun. For example, when a solar flare occurs. Um, in solar flares, uh, the sun's radiation at all the wavelengths of light increase dramatically. Um, this is the flare itself. Other stars also produce flares. Um, and some of these other stars can produce flares that uh, are, are a thousand times more energetic than the flares on the sun. So they're pretty incredible. Some wavelengths of light uh, that we just can't see during flares from other stars. 
these wavelengths are just too faint. So we rely on our knowledge of the sun to understand um, the temperatures and the processes that produce these wavelengths that we can't see from other stars. So this is really the solar cellar connection. Here I show the classification of stars um, sorted by the temperature at the deepest layers um, that we can see. Um, uh, so for the sun, this layer is about 6,000 degrees. Um, in the upper left are the big, uh, hot blue stars. On the lower right are the small, cool red dwarf stars. In the upper right are the giants and supergiants, which are enormous and cool. The sun is a middle of the road uh, star, um, a yellow star in the center of the diagram here. Um, the next closest star to us is called Proxima Centauri, and that's one of the small, uh, cool red dwarf stars in the lower right here. Um, this uh, star, Proxima Centauri, is 200,000 times uh, the Earth-Sun distance, so it's very far away. Um, what this means is that we receive about a thousand trillion fewer um, photons of light every second from this star than from the Sun. So due to how close the Sun is, we can see immaculate detail on the Sun. In a couple years, a new solar telescope will come online called the Daniel K. Inoue Solar Telescope. Um, it'll be in Hawaii, and it will be able to distinguish features that are tens of miles apart from each other on the sun. So why do we need to distinguish such detail on such a large object? The answer is magnetic fields. Uh, magnetic fields will be covered in much more detail in a later series, uh, but I'm going to talk about them very briefly because they're important for understanding flares. Um, so, uh, the sun's magnetic fields are very complex. Um, the sun is just not a big bright ball of glowing gas. Um, the sun is also a big ball of magnetic fields. They're, but they tend to, to concentrate into very small, very strong magnetic field regions. And you see several of these here. Um, the strong magnetic fields are where the surface of the sun is dark in this um, very detailed image. Um, they, they cluster into small areas, but these are still pretty large, comparable to um, the size of the Earth. Um, the biggest of these re regions are called uh, sunspots. The magnetic fields hold a lot of energy. Um, and when the magnetic fields beco become uh, twisted and tangled, they want to release this, this energy. So all this energy um, gets transferred to the atmosphere of the sun and causes it to glow, and that's the flare itself. So here's uh, a movie of a solar flare, one of my favorite movies, um, showing you the, all the complexity in a flare, all the different regions that light up. And this is what we try to understand. So in a solar flare, um, about 100 million atomic bombs worth of energy is released into these tiny brightenings. And that's the solar flare itself. Um, so I want to draw an analogy on Earth. The apparent motions of the brightening are kind of like the spreading of a forest fire on, on Earth. Um, so a forest fire uh, consists of many trees that sequentially light up and burst into flames. Whereas in a flare, magnetic field clusters or bundles sequentially light up. So we don't have uh, such dramatic movies of flares on other stars. We can't see such detail. Um, but other stars produce much more energetic flares. Um, so when a flare happens on another star, what we see is just a point, like when you look up to the sky, get brighter. So here's um, an image of a star field, as if you were to take a camera and just take a picture um, of the night sky. Uh, you can see some of the stars here um, as black points. So it's a reverse color scaling. Um, the brighter stars are, are blacker here. Uh, the image on the left, um, there are no flares occurring. But on the image on the right, um, a star produced an incredible flare. It's the star that's indicated with an arrow um, in this image. And during this flare, um, the star increased uh, in brightness by a hundred times. The sun does not do that during flares. So this was a very dramatic um, flare, another star um, that we observe. 
So what we can do with flares on other stars is we can obtain spectra. Um, we can measure the amount of blue light to the amount of red light. Um, and with this, we can measure how the temperature changes uh, during the flare. Um, so here's a spectrum of a famous flare on, the, on another star. This other star is a red, a red dwarf star. Um, we call it the mega flare because it was so huge and produced so much energy. Um, so what we show here is the flare spectrum. And with this spectrum, we can measure the temperature of the flare. So we've measured the temperature of this flare to be about 10,000 degrees. Um, this is really dramatic because normally um, the star is about 3,000 degrees. And uh, it takes a lot of energy to cause the star to go from 3,000 to 10,000 degrees. Um, we uh, have a classification for flare size in the sun, and the largest flares are called X-class flares. Um, this flare, uh, the mega flare, would have been uh, an X1 million flare. So a million times uh, more powerful um, than uh, the largest flares in the sun. There are a lot of features in the spectrum. And encoded in each of these features um, is some aspect about the physics uh, of the flare. Okay, um, I'm going to switch topics a little bit and talk about another phenomenon we observe from the sun. A phenomenon that we can't yet observe from other stars. Um, so this is another example of um, how we use our knowledge of the sun uh, and apply to other stars. Um, this phenomenon happens during large solar flares and it's called a coronal mass ejection. Um, when a flare happens, we also see uh, a bunch of material ejected from the sun. Um, this was material that was originally part of the sun's atmosphere but then is blown off. So here's a movie um, of, a, of a coronal mass ejection. I'm going to now jump back to uh, the issue of Proxima Centauri, which um, is the next closest star to us. It is a red dwarf star, one of the types of stars that produce the mega flare that I talked about earlier. Uh, coronal mass ejections happen um, during flares and other stars. It's also a really interesting uh, question to answer for our nearest star, Proxima Centauri. Here's an image of the southern sky. Um, Proxima Centauri is in the southern sky, but you can't see it with your bare eyes. It's a small, cool star, um, and it's much fainter than what you can see, although it's the next closest star to us. Um, so there was a very interesting, very exciting discovery um, about Proxima Centauri recently. Um, astronomers discovered uh, an Earth mass planet in the habitable zone of Proxima Centauri. <clears throat> now the habitable zone is the uh, distance from the star where liquid water can exist um, in the planet and therefore possibly life. Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf star. It's cooler than the sun. Therefore, you have to be a lot closer to the star um, for the same temperature as we are now from, from our sun. Um, so it turns out that the habitable zone is about 20 times closer to Proxima Centauri than the Earth is from our sun. The radiation from the flares and uh, coronal mass ejection is 400 times larger than uh, coronal mass ejections and flares um, uh, on the Earth. So Proxima Centauri is a star that we've studied um, for its flares. We've observed this star uh, with the telescope in the southern hemisphere over three nights and I'm showing you data um, from this project of the star Proxima Centauri um, in the near ultraviolet. Um, all the uh, spikes in this data here um, are the flares and the biggest flare increased the star's brightness by a factor of five as uh, something the sun does not do. Um, so what you can see that uh, the star is flaring almost all the time. Um, and so if you were around this star and on the planet in the habitable zone, it would be a very dramatic light show. Um, so it's an open question of whether there are coronal mass ejections associated with all of these flares. Um, so we can't detect coronal mass ejections around other stars, at least not yet. We would like to know if there is a dramatic effect 
on the uh, planet surrounding Proxima Centauri from all these flares and all the material that's blown off from the star during these flares. Um, hopefully we will go to our nearest star one day and we would like to know if the planet in the habitable zone has uh, an atmosphere like the Earth and we, if we can live there. Or if it's such a violent place that uh, the flares and the coronal mass ejections have blown off the atmosphere entirely. So we use the sun to try to s say something about the coronal mass ejections on other stars. And we use uh, flares as a common thread. Um, and the secret to the flares are the magnetic fields, which are very complex, and we need very, very high detail images of the sun to understand these magnetic fields. Mm -hmm. That's how it all relates together. Well, understanding the stars um, that these other planets are around is something we may not think to do, but th these other stars can be very different from the sun. Um, and we use um, common phenomenon observed in the sun and stars to try to understand the environments um, of these other planets around other stars. Thanks for joining us today. We hope that you found this webinar useful. If you have any comments or questions, please get in touch with us. You can reach us at the NSO website, www.nso.edu or you can follow us on Facebook or on Twitter. We hope you'll join us next month on December 8th, where we're going to start discussing the layers of the sun and what you can expect to see during the solar eclipse.